Hello, and welcome to Chag ParMD. This week, I have a very special guest. Dr. Lajos Pustai is Professor of Medicine and Medical Oncology here at Yale Cancer Center. He is the director of the Translational Research Program for the Breast Group, as well as co-director for Genetics, Genomics, and Epigenetics at Yale Cancer Center. In addition, he's the chair of the Breast Research Group at SWOG, the Southwest Oncology Group. Suffice it to say, he knows a lot about breast cancer management, especially from a medical oncology perspective. I thought that we would do a two-part series with him on the latest advances, first on early breast cancer and then on metastatic disease. So I hope you'll join us. I'm gonna link here uh, as well, the um, in the description box below, the course that he also has an interview in, as well as Yale Cancer Answers, our radio show, where you can catch him this month. I hope you'll really enjoy this two-part series. Let's get started. So hi, Lajos. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Hi, Anis. It's my pleasure. So I thought we'd start off by talking about early breast cancer and some of the advances that have been made, particularly on the medical oncology front in terms of early breast cancer. But before we do that, maybe you could break down for our audience a little bit about how you conceptualize early breast cancer in terms of subtypes and things that go into your thinking um, as you start to decide what kind of therapies are right for a given individual. Yeah, thank you, Anis. I think this is very timely. As I was thinking about this interview, I realized that actually we have made really tremendous advances in early stage disease in the past five to 10 years. And it's kind of rare to hear together all the advances. So getting back to your question about early stage versus late stage disease. So the simplest way to kind of remember what is early stage breast cancer, that that's disease that's localized to the breast and to the lymph nodes that drain the breast. And the most important thing to know about early stage disease, that it has a very good chance to be cured. Late stage disease or metastatic disease is disease that spread beyond the breast to other organs. And we generally believe that <clears throat> cure is a bit elusive for that group of patients, but we can keep them alive and prolong their life for many, many years. And I personally actually believe that we would be able to cure and will be able to cure metastatic disease as well with, with the available drugs and with the right strategy. That, that is so great to hear. I'm sure that a lot of people who are watching this um, just got injected with this ray of hope. Um, it's so nice to hear people actually saying that there's optimism and uh, potential hope uh, for a cure, uh, because that's all what all of us are shooting yeah. for. So, so cure is definitely a very real possibility, and in fact, more of the rule than the exception for early stage disease. And I think this will also be seen in a subset. So I, I really need to acknowledge this, that, that cure is probably going to be achievable for a subset and a minority of the, the metastatic patients. But I am very hopeful that we can actually demonstrate that. That's awesome. So let's dig into that a little bit more. When we think about early stage breast cancer, oftentimes um, we think about local therapies and we talk about systemic therapies. And local therapies are really surgery and radiation and systemic therapies are really chemotherapy, some of the targeted therapies, uh, endocrine therapy. And, and we're going to focus more on that latter bucket of systemic therapies at the moment. But when we think about that, um, Oftentimes, the, the decisions about what drugs to use really are dictated by the subtype of cancer. So can you talk a little bit about how you think about um, the different subtypes in terms of your decision making for systemic therapy in the early stage setting? Yeah, so I think with regards of molecular subtypes, the, the two most important subtypes are the estrogen receptor positive disease and the estrogen receptor negative cancers. And for the past 20 years or so, we have been <clears throat> sort of increasingly recognizing that these are indeed different diseases to the same extent as um, an acute myeloid leukemia is different from a chronic lymphocytic leukemia. They arise from different cells in the breast. 
and they have different epidemiological risk factors and they require different treatment strategies. So in addition to these two very large molecularly distinct groups, we also have additional molecular sort of markers that define specific subsets of breast cancer from a therapeutic point of view. And these include, of course, the HER2 amplified cancers, which, um, <clears throat> which imply that they would have a potential to respond to HER2 targeted therapies. And they come in two flavors, the ER positive HER2 positive and ER negative HER2 positive cancers. More recently, we also recognize that the PI3 kinase mutant subtype of ER positive cancers is also an important subtype to recognize because there is a new treatment for them. And that's a PI3 kinase inhibitor that, that improves outcome with, with endocrine therapy. And um, the um, additional molecular subtypes, which are small, include uh, breast cancers, which have a high mutation, tumor mutation burden which is now makes them eligible for immunotherapies. And, and then, of course, there's the triple negatives as well. There is the triple negative group, which is just to, sort of to say that they are estrogen, progesterone, and HER2 negative. And again, within this group, we have an additional biomarker that we can apply, and that's the PD ligand 1, immunostate chemistry, that defines a population that could benefit from immune checkpoint therapy when they have metastatic disease. So it sounds like, you know, Lyosh, from um, years past, when we would think about breast cancer simply as being ER positive or ER negative, or whether we would think about uh, cancers being, um, you know, uh, ER positive, PR positive, uh, and HER2 negative versus kind of the luminal Bs versus HER2 enriched versus triple negative. It sounds now like there is this real uh, burgeoning of biomarkers that we can look at that all have potential targets. Is that, yeah, that's exactly right. So just to kind of <clears throat> tie this um, so piece of the, the, the presentation together, the, the ER positive and ER negative groups more or less correspond to the molecular luminal versus basal subtype, which is more of the, the scientific terminology and refer to the origin of these cells originating from luminal cells in the breast versus basal epithelial cells in the breast. And within the basal group, um, we have the PD ligand positive set among the luminal ones. We have the PI3 kinase mutant subset, and we have the <clears throat> sort of the luminal A's and B's, which kind of a, a dichotomy based on the, the proliferation rate or the extent of cell proliferation that these tumors actually show. And the luminal B's being the highly proliferative cancers, which implies a greater sensitivity to chemotherapy. So, Lyos, you know, now that there's been you know, so many of these biomarkers. How do medical oncologists actually sit down and kind of decide uh, for patients, you know, what treatment is best? I mean, because I can imagine that, you know, people are given a diagnosis of breast cancer, which first of all is overwhelming. They then do some research and they figure out whether it's estrogen receptor positive or negative, and, and they can often figure out if it's HER2 positive or negative just off the PATH report. But sometimes the other markers really aren't there in terms of PI3 kinase and PDL1 and so on and so forth. So, right. so that, how, do, how do people kind of wrap their head around? Because many patients, the first question that they get that they're going to ask is, do I need chemotherapy? So how yeah. do you ha kind of help people walk through, you know, which kind of group they fit into and what therapies are right for them? So I guess that's why you need a medical oncologist. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it is also important to recognize that the value, the therapeutic sort of implications of these biomarkers differ by whether you have an early stage disease or a late stage disease. So indeed, one of the most important sort of advances in early stage disease for the ER positive patients have been the, the really the recognition and the, the increasing amount of data that, that proves that we can identify patients with ER positive or estrogen positive cancers with quite a, uh, um, quite a substantial precision who do benefit from chemotherapy versus those who do not. And there are multiple different molecular assays that can accomplish this. And they ultimately sort of identify these luminal A versus luminal B subtypes. And the assay that's most widely used in the United States and have the greatest amount of evidence behind it is the recurrence score. 
that's almost sort of routinely done now in ER positive breast cancer patients with early stage disease to really provide a personalized risk estimate about their risk of recurrence with endocrine or hormonal therapy alone. And also it defines the extent of benefit that they could expect on top of the hormonal therapy by taking chemotherapy as well. And so the good news is that these tests actually learn showed us that the, the, the large majority of the ER positive patients, in fact, can be spared of chemotherapy without any compromise in their outcome. So I want to get into both of those kind of subsets. When we think about the patients, the large majority of patients who have endocrine sensitive cancers, uh, who can benefit from endocrine therapy alone, many patients may ask, what's the difference between drugs like tamoxifen versus aromatase inhibitors? Um, are some better than others? Um, can, you, can you kind of talk a little bit about that? So in some ways, they both drugs are similar in the sense that they represent endocrine therapy and their ultimate mode of action is that they reduce the, the effect of estrogen on cancer cells. So tamoxifen is an older drug and we consider it an anti-estrogen because it blocks the, the activity of estrogen on the estrogen receptor. So it's like kind of jamming the lock <clears throat> and the, 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 the lock being the, the receptor and the key is the hormone, the estrogen hormone. So tamoxifen prevents this binding. The aromatase inhibitors are a newer class of drugs, although they have also been around for almost two decades. And what they do, they reduce the level of estrogen. So instead of sort of preventing it from binding to its target, they prevent the production of estrogen. Um, it's also important to recognize that even postmenopausal women have a, have a low level of estrogen. And what these drugs accomplish is reduce that level either, even further to very close to zero. And an important um, information to keep in mind that these drugs only work in postmenopausal patients because they don't really have the, the strengths or the efficacy to, to, to suppress ovarian estrogen production. So in order to be eligible for an anti um, so an um, aromatase inhibitor therapy, um, a woman needs to be postmenopausal, either naturally or, or, or taking drugs to suppress the ovaries. So for premenopausal women, is there a benefit to uh, suppressing their ovarian function um, with a, a medication or removing their ovaries and then being put on an aromatase inhibitor versus taking tamoxifen? Yes. So this has been controversial up until about four or five years ago when two large randomized trials have demonstrated beyond doubt that <clears throat> suppressing the ovaries and taking an aromatase inhibitor produces improved outcome, fewer recurrences than just taking tamoxifen alone, which used to be the, the old standard of care. But I need to add that this benefit really becomes sort of clinically meaningful only in patients who are higher risk for recurrence. Um, so improving the outcome really doesn't mean much when your outcome is already very good with right. surgery alone or with just tamoxifen alone. As the risk of recurrence increases, so do the benefit, the absolute benefit that a woman could expect from this combined modality hormonal therapy. And of course, the downside is that when you do two different drugs and you become postmenopausal and you further reduce the estrogens, there are more side effects than just taking tamoxifen alone. Right. And the other thing that women need to understand is that, you know, once you, um, you know, once you, you go through a surgery, for example, to remove your ovaries, uh, you know, that, that also adds surgical burden um, too. Now, um, the, the other question that premenopausal women may ask is, can they ever get pregnant after that? Uh, you know, you're, you're putting them into menopause, whether with tamoxifen or uh, with uh, an LHRH uh, agonist and uh, an AI or with oophorectomy. Is it possible to get pregnant after that? Should they get pregnant after that? Is, are there risks associated with pregnancy after breast cancer treatment with endocrine therapy? 
Um, yes, women could get pregnant. And so far, <clears throat> there is no evidence that would suggest that this is detrimental in any ways for the, the, the breast, the former, the previous breast cancer it would increase the risk of, of a woman dying from breast cancer or increase the risk of a recurrence. However, getting pregnant or becoming pregnant after uh, breast cancer therapy is not that easy. And probably the safest option for younger women who plan on having children in the future is some form of an um, um, egg freezing or um, some other fertility um, preservation um, mm. approach because um, the chemotherapy component or the lengthy endocrine therapy component indeed could make women permanently postmenopausal as a sort of an adverse effect. Yeah. But as far as getting pregnant in the future, there is no evidence that this is harmful for the breast cancer itself. So lots of things for premenopausal women to think about uh, in terms of deciding on endocrine therapy. The other thing about removing ovaries, of course, is that it can reduce your ovarian cancer risk as well if you uh, have a BRCA mutation. Laos, the other question that I wanted to ask you uh, was with regards to duration of endocrine therapy. So many women who are on endocrine therapy now for an estrogen receptor positive cancer were told in the past that five years of whatever drug it was, tamoxifen, an aromatase inhibitor, was all they needed to take. Now there are whispers that it might even be 10 years. And then there are whispers that there might even be another drug. Can you clarify some of those things? Yeah, so that's another important advance that again has more meaning in the context of high risk than in low risk. There's little doubt. In fact, four or five large randomized trials show this, that extending the duration of endocrine therapy beyond five years is beneficial and reduces the risk of late recurrences. We refer to late recurrences as events, metastatic recurrences or new um, breast cancers in the breast or, or local recurrences in the breast or lymph nodes that happen after five years. And um, up to 50% of all events can actually happen after five years in ER positive disease. And extending the endocrine therapy reduces that risk of a future breast cancer events after five years. Again, the absolute benefit that a woman would gain depends on the absolute risk. Um, yeah, and I think that that's so important to understand um, because many women also are under the illusion that if I make it to five years, it's some magic number, and that after that I'm, I'm free and clear, uh, which really isn't, isn't the case. Talk a little bit it's about- not the case, but um, we do have some, um, some ideas about who actually remain at risk after five years. Um, so it's true that the, the, um, the greatest risk is actually the first five years. That's when then um, <clears throat> recurrence is sort of uh, front loaded. But then in the remaining 10 to 15 years, events still happen, although less frequently, but they add up over a 15 year period. So there are clinical features and also molecular features of the cancer that could inform about the risk of a late recurrence. So there is a molecular test which has been validated to be, to be fairly accurate to identify women who actually is at risk for a recurrence beyond five years. And it also gauges the estimated benefit that extended endocrine therapy would provide. So the, the best validated sort of uh, assay in that context is the breast cancer index, because it was run on clinical trials, which indeed tested the extended endocrine therapy concept. And so, Laosh, talk a little bit more about these other newer drugs that people are now talking about to even add to extended adjuvant therapy in the endocrine setting for uh, ER positive disease. So there are two additional important advances in, in the uh, treatment of early stage ER positive breast cancer. So one of them is the recognition that, that taking a bisphosphonate or Zometa um, infusions once every six months for three to five years, um, not only protects women's bone from osteoporosis, which is a risk when, when women become 
postmenopausal, they lose calcium from them, their bone, and the antagonizing the estrogenic effects, either with tamoxifen or with the aromatase inhibitors, reducing their estrogen level further, exposes them for, for greater risk for osteoporosis. The Zomena infusions or a bisphosphonate infusion um, helps to prevent that, but it also improves survival and in some ways makes the bones more hostile for a bony recurrence. It reduces the risk of bone recurrences and improves survival. So if you routinely use a bisphosphonate infusion every six months for three to five years in postmenopausal ER positive patients who receive an aromatase inhibitor therapy, does it have to be an infusion? Uh, can it be oral bisphosphonates? Are those equally effective? Um, they are probably equally effective, but the oral bisphosphonates that we are using in the US have not been prospectively tested um, to show equivalence. Um, the two other oral bisphosphonates that are more available in, in uh, Europe actually have shown equivalence with the IV4, with the Zomera that we use here. Okay, great. You were telling us about the other drug. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, so the other one is actually very, very recent. It's literally uh, maybe a week old news. And it was presented at the European Society of Medical Oncology uh, conference, um, I think last week. And there was a large clinical trial that to the women who had high risk for recurrence because they had multiple positive lymph nodes and randomized them to the best current standard of care with an aromatase inhibitor, or added a CDK4-6 inhibitor. These are drugs which block a particular enzyme that's very important for cell proliferation, and has been shown to, to improve outcome, even survival in metastatic ER-positive breast cancer, then combined with hormonal therapy. So we took this combination, the um, endocrine treatment plus the CDK4-6 inhibitor with a drug called obamacyclib, um, to the early stage setting to see if you take this drug for two years along with your endocrine therapy, which of course will go on for five to 10 years, will reduce the risk of the recurrence. And it did. So it improved the, the outcome by, by 3% in terms of absolute values, but in other ways to, in, in other ways to express this, it reduced the risk of, of a recurrence by about 25, 30%. Now, in that trial, did they get the CDK4-6 inhibitor as the first two years, or, or yes. did they get it at the end? No, they got it at the first two years, so they could start it within a year of their, their surgery. Um, and I, I should add that this combination is not yet approved by the FDA or by any of the European um, sort of regulatory organizations um, yet. But the oh clinical God. trial data is very clear and clean, and it does show an improvement by adding the CDK4-6 inhibitor drug, the obamacyclib, to the standard of care endocrine therapy for this high-risk population. So my question then is, if and when this drug does get FDA approved, as it sounds like it will in this setting, given the clinical trial data, there are literally thousands, perhaps millions of women who are already in that five to 10 years of endocrine therapy. Is there value for them to add the CDK4-6 inhibitor when they are say in, in year four or in year six? Um, or it, do you think that there's really some magic to starting it closer to uh, the end of your local therapy? I think nobody really <clears throat> knows the, the answer to this. So they try to use drugs in a very similar or identical setting <clears throat> as they were tested in the clinical trials. So I think in the starting these within the first year of the surgery <clears throat> will, be, will be common. Going beyond this time frame and starting it three or four or five years after your surgery, it's gonna be highly individualized. Another really important thing to emphasize that really the benefit is only clinically meaningful in patients who are high risk for recurrence. So in this particular trial, um, close to 70% of patients had four or more positive lymph nodes. Mm. That's fortunately quite rare because we, we tend to diagnose breast cancer, at least in the United States, at an earlier stage when there are no lymph nodes involved at all or only one or two or three. Yeah, um, one wonders, uh, you know, in low to middle income settings where the majority of patients present uh, at late stage, 
whether this could be something that could really be helpful. Um, so yes, what, I think this could be helpful. And one additional thing that I, I should probably add for just to, for the sake of completeness yeah. is that this study is reporting out the first results and it's not the final results from this trial. And one really important component or piece of the results is not major or it's not really <clears throat> known with certainty. And that's the impact on, on overall survival. Yeah, but I think that, you know, even when we think about survival data, when we can see benefits in reducing recurrence, many women will say, you know what, I, I, I don't particularly want a recurrence either, um, even if my survival rate is the same. Um, and I think part of the reason for that um, is because many women really don't want all of the toxicities of treatment that go along with that. So I wanna move now into that second kind of group, still in the early stage, um, where uh, patients require chemotherapy. So let's say you're ER positive, you um, had an Oncotype DX uh, or recurrent score assay, um, and you have, um, well, before we get to the high risk group, if you're in that intermediate zone, um, how do you help patients decide to take chemotherapy or not take chemotherapy? There seems to be a bit of a, a gray zone, at least in terms of that particular assay. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the <clears throat> one particular assay, which is the recurrent score. And that's not because that's the only assay that could accomplish this goal, but because that's where the cleanest and largest amount of clinical data is. So there was a very large clinical trial called the Taylor RX trial, which addressed this issue that what is the, th the, the proper threshold in with regards to the score itself to say that you do benefit from chemotherapy or you do not and to quantify the benefit. Is it a 1% improvement, 2% and 3% improvement? And what this study taught us is that really the benefit is a continuum and we need to use different thresholds for premenopausal or younger women, younger than 50 and postmenopausal women. And we use a lower threshold or we have sort of a lower bar to recommend chemotherapy for younger women because there is evidence that in younger women, the chemotherapy benefit is greater. So the threshold to recommend chemotherapy for women who are younger than, than 50 is actually 20, whereas the score uh, 20 or, <clears throat> or greater, whereas for women who are 50 or older, it's, it's 26 or greater. And the further away you are from this threshold, the greater the benefit is. But below that threshold, really, there is no justification to use chemotherapy. Whether you take chemotherapy for a score of 26 or 27, that's a somewhat individual decision, and we would respect that. But if your score is 35, I think it would be risky not to do the chemotherapy. Um, the, a good thing that I like about the report in the essay is that it actually provides you these numerical benefits. And um, many patients find it helpful to say, well, this 1% improvement in outcome versus for me, or this 3% improvement versus for me, or it does not. Another way to, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna ask, you know, so so the upper bound of the threshold seems to be pretty clear, uh, whether for premenopausal or postmenopausal women, you know, a threshold of 20 or 26. What if you're in that kind of gray zone, you've got a score of 18, um, how, how do you advise patients? So 18 is actually no longer a gray zone. So what this study actually took is really <clears throat> sort of um, removed this gray zone. So they, 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 there is very clear data from the Taylor RX, which includes many thousands of women, that really there is not even a hint that there would be benefit or that outcome would improve in premenopausal women with the score less than 20. Okay. And the same is seen for, for uh, women who are 50 or, or older, if their score is below 25, there is no hint that there is real benefit. The issue is that the, you as a person think that it's actually worth taking chemotherapy for a 2% improvement or a reduction, a 2% reduction in risk of recurrence when your score is 27, right? And that's a highly individualized decision. So 2%, you know, so these are distant recurrences. And another important thing to understand is that we use, use this term recurrence very broadly, but really there are two kinds of recurrences. One that's a distant metastatic recurrence 
And that would, it's really good to avoid that because that is currently uh, an incurable disease. And there are local recurrences, which are still curable. And um, <clears throat> the report in the Oncotype DX actually reports the distant recurrences, the metastatic recurrences. So every one of those is, is a potential death to be avoided. Right. So 2% improvement means that out of 100 women, two will not die from this disease. We may not be able to detect this in trials because thanks for God, deaths will come many, many years, even decades later than the initial diagnosis, even with metastatic cancer. So Lyle, when you have somebody who has a high recurrence score and you're going to give them chemotherapy, how do you decide with the patient what kind of chemotherapy to give? It, uh, in those patients, are you doing particular biomarkers for all cancers in terms of PI3 kinase and, and so on and so forth? Or, or is there some you know, kind of gestalt that you have in terms of um, giving people particular regimens? Yeah, <clears throat> so while we have a test that generally identifies whether a person would benefit from chemotherapy or not, we do not have tests which would identify what particular type of chemotherapy or what particular chemotherapy drug particular disease or cancer would be susceptible for. So there are no really tests that could distinguish between different kinds of chemotherapy regimens. However, we do know that chemotherapy regimens vary in efficacy and a little bit in toxicity, and particularly in terms of, of the particular types of toxicity that, that patients could experience. So there are first generation, second generation, third generation chemotherapies, and they imply that as the generation increases, they get more effective, but they also get more complex. There are more and more drugs involved, and they tend to be longer as well. So my philosophy is, simple. I think if someone needs chemotherapy, you might as well get the best chemotherapy. So the decision is really big between needing chemotherapy or not. And the quality of life is very different. But if you do chemotherapy, the difference between the chemotherapies is actually quite minor. I may represent a minority in this respect among um, my colleagues. Many oncologists have sort of strong feelings that certain chemotherapies are very easy. I don't believe that it's the case. So actually, chemotherapies tend to share side effects. And um, if I recommend a chemotherapy, I tend to recommend the most effective chemotherapy. And keep in mind that a chemotherapy is not like taking out a bank loan. You are not stuck with it. If you have a lot of side effects, we can always abort the plan. And there are ways to make treatment easier by changing the schedule, adding additional drugs, reducing the dose of the treatment. Yeah. My favorite chemotherapy regimen is, includes a weekly taxol or weekly paclitaxel for 12 treatments. And that's um, a small amount of chemotherapy given frequently, weekly, but this way it's more effective than giving a larger amount less frequently and has less side effects. And I, I also include um, four additional treatments with an entracycline-based chemotherapy that's called uh, AC. And we do that every two weeks. And so that, uh, that uh, kind of block of chemotherapy can take several months because many patients are wondering how many, how long do I have to go through chemotherapy? Uh, you know, am I gonna lose my hair? Um, am I gonna get really sick? So it's nice to know that there are things that can be done um, to reduce some of those side effects. When we start thinking now about, um, so, so, so that was really kind of talking about the, the ER positive uh, group. Um, we talked a little bit at the beginning uh, about um, the, this HER2 targeted uh, therapies. Um, so, so talk a little bit about that and the drugs that we have and whether you like to give this regimen um, before surgery or after surgery, whether you use one drug or two drugs, how, how do you make those decisions? So um, of the various types of breast cancers, probably our greatest success story is the HER2 positive um, subtype, because that's a group where we have highly effective drugs, which really um, improve the cure rates in early stage disease and also prolong patients' life substantially 
if they were to uh, experience a recurrence of a metastatic disease. So um, in addition to a, a repertoire of drugs, which include Herceptin, Pertuzumab, and <clears throat> chemotherapy sort of um, a conjugated form of her of trastuzumab or herceptin called TDM1 or Godzilla. So these three drugs are the mainstay of HER2 target therapy in early stage disease. Um, <clears throat> the HER2 targeted drugs have um, a particular side effect, which is rare but potentially troubling and serious, and they can weaken the heart. So these drugs are com can be combined with the tech or a taxane-based chemotherapy, but they cannot be combined with the anthracycline part. So if we use chemotherapy, then we usually do the anthracycline part first and then follow up with a taxane concurrent with the, the herceptin and um, the pertuzumab. So taxol and herceptin is better, more effective than taxol alone, and taxol, herceptin, pertuzumab is better than just taxol and herceptin together. And better implies that they actually improve or reduce the risk of a recurrence. So one of the most important um, sort of recent changes in our strategy has been the recognition that doing the chemotherapy for HER2 positive disease, and maybe we will talk about it later also for, for triple negative disease, doing the chemotherapy if someone needs chemotherapy before the surgery is a very, very smart and intelligent strategy to do because we can read out directly how sensitive the cancer voice to the treatment. And in the ER negative, HER2 positive population, the complete eradication rates of the cancer from the breast and lymph nodes just by chemotherapy given before surgery can be as high as 80%. So this, um, as you would imagine, predicts that the cancer was highly sensitive it demonstrates that the cancer was highly sensitive to the chemotherapy, and it implies that any micrometastatic disease, which is really the main purpose of the systemic therapy, to sort of sterilize the rest of the body from, from cancer cells which may have left the breast and hide in other organs, even before the surgeon gets to it or even before the diagnosis is made. So that's the main purpose of these systemic therapies, and that's how it improves um, outcome and survival. So if the, the main cancer in the breast has gone from two or three or four centimeters to zero, then it's very likely that the micrometastatic few cells also died out. And that's indeed the case. So patients who experience this re really excellent outcome, we call it pathological complete response, they do really well. On the other hand, if there is a chemo uh, cancer that survives this treatment, and we see that at the time of the surgery, there is a plan B. And this plan B wouldn't be there if you start with surgery, because then you don't know how well the, the best chemotherapy works today. If you get the best chemotherapy first, then you can read out how well it worked. And if it didn't work so well, if, you, if a patient is in this 20% or 30% who, who did not accomplish the complete response, getting an additional drug. And that drug is basically Herceptin or Trastuzumab conjugated or coupled to a chemotherapy agent. And that's called TDM1 or Godzilla. And taking one year or, um, or receiving treatment for one year with this agent after the surgery, again, has been shown to improve outcome compared to just doing what we typically do, one year of Herceptin. So that's the reason why doing neoadjuvant or preoperative chemotherapy makes a lot of sense, because it provides an opportunity to read out how well the chemotherapy worked. And if it didn't work as well as we hoped for, then there is a backup option that can improve a patient's survival. Yeah, I, I really like the whole concept of neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, for so many reasons, and that that certainly is one of them. From a surgical perspective, it also uh, shrinks the cancer and, and makes it uh, yes. potentially easier to, to conserve the breast. One one question that patients may have is if they if they achieve that pathologic complete response, and as you say, we're beginning to see more and more of that. Why then do they still need to have um, more therapy in the HER2 positive setting? Because we'll still recommend that they get a year of Herceptin. Yeah, I'm not sure that they actually need that, but that's the standard of care because that's how the clinical trials were done. And they might have been done this way because it's a good business strategy for the companies to make these drugs. But of course, this is difficult to really no, because there are no clinical trials in that space that would have compared 
accomplishing PCR and taking the additional six or seven months of herceptin versus not doing anything. Yeah. Uh, but They've the non-pessimists would the say that there might still be some micrometastatic disease that um, mm. could still be floating around that that might be helpful for because pathology, you know, samples the the tissue that was removed but can't look for every single solitary cell. So if you if you yeah. want to be an optimist and not be a, a pessimist about drug company profits, that would be another way to look at it, I suppose. It probably doesn't make a lot of sense in, the, in ER negative patients. So, you know, if the chemotherapy, if 20 weeks of chemotherapy plus Herceptin plus Pertuzumab did not eradicate the, the micrometastatic cells, Herceptin alone for another six months won't do it either. It's very unlikely, right? Um, but continuing Herceptin um, in patients who have estrogen receptor positive disease, could possibly make sense because the same way as, as trastuzumab and pertuzumab is synergistic with chemotherapy drugs. They are also synergistic with endocrine therapy. So whatever endocrine therapy a patient receives, let's say an, an AI or an aromatase inhibitor, that drug works better um, when, when Herceptin is on board. So for ER positive patients, having a Herceptin component on board makes a lot of sense. In fact, for the ER positive patients, there is data to show that, that going beyond the one year of Herceptin in the adjuvant setting, so completing a total of one year, including the chemotherapy part, going beyond that and taking a second year of a HER2 targeted drug um, could actually improve outcome concurrent with endocrine therapy. But because of the added side effects and toxicities, we really reserve that only for high risk. ER positive, HER2 positive patients. Yeah, so again, in that setting, it may or may not be beneficial if you if you achieved a pathologic complete response. Right. So um, <clears throat> so I want to move now to to that that last group um, of triple negative breast cancers. So these are the cancers, you know, where endocrine therapy is out, uh, HER2 directed therapy is out. And many patients kind of look at this as a really scary phenomenon uh, because we know that uh, triple negative breast cancer tends to have poor biology um, and uh, tends to be of higher grade, often affecting younger patients. We did a video not so long ago, and I'll link it here for those who are interested, of a 28-year-old African-American lady who was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. So. What is your approach there, Laos? So, um, triple negative breast cancer indeed was um, the subset where the least amount of progress has been made in the past sort of 20 years, um, up until very recently, up until the past, let's say, two years. So, there were really no new drugs or new treatment strategies that would have improved outcome in triple negative disease after the introduction of taxanes or taxol into the, the, the chemotherapy regimen, which happened in the 1990s. What we learned though in the past few years is again that this strategy of doing the chemotherapy upfront before the surgery is a very um, good strategy for triple negative patients as well, because they also have a plan B, a backup option that they could receive after the surgery if, they can, if there is a substantial amount of cancer that survived the initial chemotherapy, the preoperative chemotherapy. And that backup option is called capsidabine or Zaloda. It's an oral chemotherapy drug that again has been shown in a randomized trial to reduce the risk of recurrence in patients who have residual cancer after neoadjuvant chemotherapy compared to observation. So the, the preoperative strategy is the strategy that's increasingly used in the, in the, the management of, of triple negative breast cancer. And uh, it's needless to say that they are estrogen negative and HER2 negative. So the only systemic treatment option to improve the outcome and reduce the risk of a distant recurrence is chemotherapy. Um, another important advance, which still yet to translate into a FDA approval, is the recognition and the results from four different randomized trials, which consistently show that including an immune checkpoint inhibitor drug, an anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-ligand-1 drug, 
with the standard care chemotherapy improves this pathological COVID response rate. So it bumps it up from 40-50% that chemotherapy could accomplish to, to closer to 60-65%. And so, you know, and, and that actually, uh, the patient that we were talking about in the video that I mentioned uh, that I, I will link for you actually was in a clinical trial of uh, an immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, in the neoadjuvant setting as well. Do we uh, look at patients who are triple negative and routinely check uh, for their PD-1 status um, and offer them immunotherapy up front? Or is that something that is still in the realm of clinical trials and or is used as a, as a backup? So quite remarkably and, and somewhat counterintuitively, um, in the early stage neoadjuvant setting, PD ligand one expression or even the expression of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or other immune markers in the cancer do not define the population that selectively benefits from the inclusion of an immune checkpoint therapy. So checking PD ligand one expression or even counting lymphocytes in the tumor does not actually identify the patients who need the immune checkpoint therapy because we see the same magnitude of improvement in the pathological CR rate, even in patients who are completely negative for PD ligand one expression or have very little lymphocytes. Um, <clears throat> so that's very different from the metastatic setting that we might talk about later, where <clears throat> PD ligand one is, is actually an important marker that defines the group that needs the PD ligand one drug. But that doesn't hold in early stage disease. So unfortunately, in early stage triple negative breast cancer, at the time of the diagnosis, there are no biomarkers that could help us to define the prognosis in the same accurate way as we do for estrogen positive disease, or there are no markers to define what additional treatment to use beyond chemotherapy. So how do you decide who to, who to offer immune therapy to in, in the early stage disease? I think we, once these drugs become available in the clinic, then we probably will offer them to very broadly to all patients who are, who are triple negative and have cancers that are bigger than one centimeter or two centimeters. Yeah. Well, it's nice to know that at least there's hope on the horizon for many patients with early stage breast cancer um, to potentially get cured. And there, there are so many options out there. I, well, that was fabulous. Now, don't forget everyone, Next time, we are going to do the second part of this series on metastatic breast cancer. I hope you'll join us. Until next week, please do like, share, and subscribe. Tell your friends about this channel. We're trying to grow a community really based around evidence-based health and wellness. Until next time, I'm Dr. Anise Chagkar, wishing you all a safe and healthy week.